Welcome to the 5th Annual Latinas Lead Virtual Power Summit, brought to you by the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado, with the generous support of Colorado Housing Finance Authority, CHAFA, Colorado Health Foundation, Molson Coors Beverage Company, Excel Energy, and Denver Metro Chamber Leadership Foundation. The Latinas Lead Power Summit is an annual gathering where Latinas of all ages experience a learning environment through storytelling that is designed to shape their personal and professional development. Latinas Lead exists to strengthen the leadership development of Latinas through storytelling so they can drive social change. The Latino Community Foundation of Colorado pursues civic, economic, and cultural opportunities that drive a more authentic narrative about Latinos in the state and cement a healthy and vibrant future where all Latino Coloradans will prosper. To learn more about the work of the Latino Community Foundation, follow us on the following social media platforms. During this morning's program, we encourage you to engage with one another and our program speakers using the live chat feature. Today's summit will feature Opening presentation, Finding Your Path, featuring Kali Fajardo Einstein. Author Kali Fajardo Einstein of Sabrina and Corina, a fierce and essential collection of short stories about Latinas and indigenous American women, set against the remarkable backdrop of Denver and Southern Colorado. Co-hosts and journalists, Kristen Aguirre and Lori Lizarraga. Featured speaker, Christina Garcia, founder of She Grows, We Grow. Featured speaker, Veronica Torres Hazley, founder of Hey Chica Lifestyle Movement. Illustrator, Brian Montes Terrazas, joined by his mother, business owner, Lourdes Terrazas, for a one-of-a-kind visual power rendering. We'll hear from the 2021 Latinas Lead Influencer Awardee, Colorado Senadora, the Honorable Julie Gonzalez, District 34. Climate Justice Warrior, Sonrisa Lucero. Our Inspiración segment will feature local poet and performing artist from Roaring Forks, Colorado, Bianca Lisbeth Godina. Amplifying the voices of Generation Z, we will hear their diverse perspectives around the issues that matter most to them through their own curated creative video shorts. Our program will close with Canciones y Conversaciones de Poder, a musical journey of self-discovery and resilience by singer, songstress, and voiceover artist Stephanie Peña. To begin our program, LCFC is proud to welcome author of the widely acclaimed Sabrina and Corina for the opening presentation, Finding Your Path, Kali Fajardo Einstein. I want to acknowledge that today is June 15th, and this is an incredibly important holiday, um, and I stand in solidarity with all of Black people. Today, I would like to talk to you about resiliency and about taking shelter in our goals and preserving in the face of great adversity, because I think now more than ever, what we need to feel enough to follow our dreams is to trust in our imaginations, our own intuition, and an understanding that our lives as Latinas are part of something far greater than ourselves. I published a book called Sabrina and Karina, which many of you may have read, but it wasn't long ago that I was dreaming of becoming a published author. In the late summer of 2017, um, I went to the house in Mexico, and in that sapphire mountain range that many of my sisters own. Nearly a pudding ounce of my being, my passion, I find two books, a short collection called Sabrina and Corina, and a novel called Woman of Light. 
I received a phone call that changed my life. But like many memorable turning points in one's life, this phone call came as I walked into a dirty public restroom. Hi, it's Julia, my litter agent said in her bright and endearing tone over the phone. Random House, she said, is making an offer. What? I said in disbelief. I stood in a dimly lit gas station bathroom after having waited in line for 10 minutes. And when you have been driving arid mountain roads, guzzling coffee and drinking water, you cannot, I repeat, you cannot lose your place in the queue. Am I getting a book deal, I asked, for the novel? At this point in my life, I had abandoned all hope that my short story collection, Sabrina and Karina, would ever see publication. We don't have details just yet, Julia said, but an offer is confirmed. It needs to be routed through. And at this point, I really did have to hang up and go to the bathroom because someone gentle yet firm was pounding on the door. Before getting off the phone that evening, Julia told me that she would email me first thing as soon as the offer hit. It was midnight when the email finally came through. I was writing myself for bed in some Hampton Inn when I looked down at my iPhone and I burst into tears. Random House did not just want one of my books, but the young and brilliant editor Nicole Counts had made an offer on both books. In that moment, pulling my first book, Sabrina and Karina, out from the depths of the underworld, I cried. My knees buckled. I called my family and I couldn't get out the words. Once I had finished the rapturous midnight celebration, I looked through the darkened hotel window at night. Thank you, ancestors, I whispered. Thank you for everything you have given me. As a writer, I teach workshops across the country. Much of my teaching focuses on resiliency and grit, the pain and difficulty of dealing with generational trauma and healing, and developing an almost prayer-like devotion to craft and achieving our goals. I work with students of all levels and backgrounds, and what I find time and time again is that everyone wants to know the answer to that magic question. How do I publish a book? To be honest, I don't know. No one does. How is anyone capable of writing and then publishing a book? The sheer magnitude of it, the time little by little stolen here or there, the luck, the coincidences, the fortitude. So while I don't know much about the invisible hand of fate, that all consuming driving force, that cousin of time, I do know a thing or two about not giving up on your dreams. And believe me, there were many times that I wanted to put down the pen forever, that I begged for a less, how do I put this, tortured, artistic existence. Sometimes while I'm giving readings, an audience member will ask, what has changed since you've become a published author? I've played around with a few answers. The surreal pride in seeing my books on shelves now across the world, translated into Japanese, German, Italian, and very soon Spanish and Turkish. Or the fairy tale of bringing my own mother to New York City for the first time to walk the red carpet with me for the National Book Awards in 2019. But in all truthfulness, what has most changed is my newfound reverence for the young Latina I once was and her ability to dream big. Many of you have probably seen the Instagram post that often makes the rounds. Be who you needed when you were younger, a quote attributed to the writer Aisha Siddiqui. I loved this quote when I first saw it, and I still do. I was filled with memories of the young girl I once was, sullen, secretive, and deeply sad. That girl who loved to read and talk and storm into any room, any family video, arms outstretched, face tilted back, mouth open wide as I yelled into the camera, watch me. Watch me. It seems then, or especially then, my desire to be seen was all consuming. As a second eldest of seven children, I was used to being shushed or spoken over at the dinner table. I knew what it felt like to dance around my exhausted father after work shouting, Papa, Papa, to no acknowledgement. 
And I knew in more sinister ways what it felt like to turn on the television, to open a book, to browse through a teen magazine, to flip on the radio, or to sit front row in the movie theater and never once see a character who resembled me or who came from my complicated mixture of ancestry. To put it bluntly, I knew what invisibility felt like. I knew what it felt like to have my ancestors never appear in my history textbooks at school. No mention of our Colorado, a convergence of Spanish and indigenous, and in my own family, later Filipino and Jewish lineage. I decided early on that I would become a writer and I would make damn sure that our stories and our people were not forgotten. But what I hadn't decided on yet was how I was going to do that. That's when I realized I needed to use my imagination. It is through the imagination that I dreamed of myself, a Chicana from Denver who had never known someone remotely associated with New York City publishing into my life now as an author. It is through the imagination that I dreamed myself into graduate school, though long before that, I had dropped out of high school. It is through the imagination that I believe someday a book like Sabrina and Corina could mean something to somebody else. For all the years that I struggled to receive just one story acceptance in a big magazine, I dreamed of my short story collection and my novel as I washed my hair and wiped my eyes in the shower. I imagined my book covers laying before me as open and vast as the Rocky Mountains that I come from. And for all the years that I was told no, I dreamed of the day that I finally would hear yes. This ability to dream big has made any success I have possible. And I believe that this ability is something which lessens over time, if not refueled, if not nurtured, if not given more hope. So the question is, how do we all refill our wells of resiliency? How do we keep going when the world around us seems to only say stop? In, 20, in 2007, as a college senior, I wrote the literary agent, Susan Burkholz, an email requesting that Sandra Cisneros visit my college, Metropolitan State University of Denver. It was the 25th anniversary of her beloved book, House on Mango Street, and her agent was kind enough to write back and said that while Sandra couldn't make it this year, she was scheduled to come to Denver the following year. I was heartbroken. I would be away from Colorado for the very first time for my first year of graduate school or so I thought. In 2007, with very limited knowledge about what a creative writing graduate program even was, I applied to eight universities, the best of the best. When I received only one acceptance, my choice was made for me. And so I packed my bags, said goodbye to my family, and I moved all alone to California, where I thought my dreams of becoming a writer would finally become a reality. During my one year in California, I wrote six embarrassingly autobiographical short stories. During that year, I also made weekly phone calls to my 89-year-old Auntie Lucy on Gallo Pago Street on Denver's West Side. She spoke of aches and medicines, scandalous neighbors and glamorous actresses, and I told her about the ocean and palm trees, boardwalks and frozen yogurt. I also spoke of the ants how they marched forth from cracks in my walls, lime green cabinets, a glittery and pulsating black line moving from one end of my sunny California kitchen to another. That place sounds like a real dump, my auntie would say, but I'm here to write stories, I would tell her. And she'd change the subject, mentioning a good sale on pork at the Albertsons or how my cousin had just won big at the casino in Blackhawk, or as they would say, up the hill. See, my baby, she would say, come home. You don't belong so far away. My Auntie Lucy died that year on Valentine's Day. I wasn't in Colorado to witness her final breath, but several of my siblings told me it was oddly satisfying, like watching a starving woman gorging herself on edible air. It was the first time that a major family event, the death of a matriarch, occurred while I was a thousand miles away. 
I began to fantasize about dropping out of my MFA program, but I had already dropped out of high school. And the thought of being rejected from nearly every major university yet again filled me with a sadness so great that I felt at times like I was drowning. Then the worst thoughts crossed my mind, thoughts of no longer wanting to be here, thoughts that even now are hard for me to admit. Seeking healing, I went home to Colorado and I visited my family. Now, some might call what happened next a form of divine intervention, but I like to think of it as the universe flexing her imagination. During my trip home to Denver, I was shocked to discover that my idol, the woman whose work had changed my life, Sandra Cisneros herself, was to read on my college campus. I went to the event with my grandfather, who adores Sandra's work. We sat in the middle of the auditorium, the energy in that great hall, one of absolute devotion. I can't remember all that was said, but at a certain point, I was frozen with the feeling of being understood. In front of everyone, the whole crowd, Sandra Cisneros told us that there were times when she was so depressed that she had considered suicide. But about two weeks later, she received life-altering news. She had been awarded her second National Endowment for the Arts grant and learned that House on Mango Street would be reissued by Penguin Random House, essentially launching the book toward its firm position in American history. I can't believe what I was hearing from this brilliant light whose work had illuminated countless hearts, who had given me and so many other Latinas like me the belief that we could be writers, that we could achieve our goals. Now, I, as they say, the rest is history. I became a dropout for the second time, but I came back home and I finished out the year and I moved back to Denver. And I committed myself to reapplying to graduate programs. It was lesson one in my path to resiliency as an artist and as a Chicana. It was the first time that I realized this too shall pass, but it also showed me I was not alone in my hardship. Those whom I idolized and admired had also experienced great struggles and through the camaraderie of their stories, I felt the possibility for achievement. I felt that I could go on. You are your best thing, a dear friend once told me, quoting a line from Toni Morrison's Beloved. I share these stories with you all today because maybe you have considered giving up on your dreams. Maybe you have received more than your fair share of rejection from jobs, colleges, lovers, or friends. Maybe your own life is keeping you from your passion and goals. To that I say, please do not give up. We need you and your unique gifts. There was someone like me, someone like you, trying for years and years coming from behind, needing the guidance of the light and putting in the world. I do not know when your next lucky break will come, but I do know there can be pleasure in the path, no matter how jacket it may seem. Thank you very much for having me. Co-hosting this year's Virtual Power Summit, help me in welcoming two amazing journalists and hermanas who have bravely initiated a national conversation around equity and inclusion in news. Kristen Aguirre and Lori Lizarraga. Uh, well, it's, everything's virtual this year, so, you know, please bear with us as we go through the kinks a little bit. So what we're talking about is how yeah. amazing yeah. that movie was. I was completely moved and almost brought to tears just by the emotion and the passion she has. Every time I see another Latina up there, I feel like I'm looking at myself, right? So we're supporting each other because we, as if one of us makes it, we all make it. Golly, thank you so much for sharing your story and your book with us, Sabrina and Sabrina and Karina. Lori, I'm so excited to be here and of course be standing next to you virtually and to be part of the summit again. So a few years ago, I actually had the great pleasure of being here to introduce our friend and the missing piece of our Trinity, Sonia Gutierrez, who shared her personal story and journey at the summit that year. It was so beautiful and power. And I just remember the energy that was in that space with over 200 Latinas from across Colorado. I'm surprised I was even able to hear anything because we're talking so much. And we even had a few participants join us from Mexico. It was incredible. That is incredible. And Sonia was posting about this event too for us this time around. I love the way the three of us always support each other. And I love how much we've all gotten to be involved. It's incredible. 
event now for the fifth year in a row this has been going on and i love that you know it had to be virtual the colorado community foundation did not let virtual COVID anything get in the way of this incredible yeah. event and i've seen today's lineup kristen and even though we're coming to you virtually this year i promise mm -hmm. Everyone watching with us this morning, today's program will be just as dynamic and inspiring as all the other previous summits. We can already see that. Girl, I totally agree with you. So where do we start? As Lori mentioned, today's program will be dynamic and amazing. It's filled with courageous and fearless Latinas. And can I get a drum roll, please? There you go. Thank you. For the first time ever, we even have a gifted and talented Latino. That's right. We let one man in here, ladies, just one. And he's going to be creating a one of a kind illustration inspired by you, our community of Latinas. So, of course, we let a man in here to help us, but only one. Now, the best thing about this segment is that he is creating this beautiful image while his mother, Lourdes, shares her personal story. And I cannot wait for you guys to see all of this. It sounds amazing, Kristen. And after more than a year of just craziness for everyone, all of us, this whole summit, I feel like it's the encouragement that we all need. I mean, this last year yes. has been insane, and I don't know where to begin exactly, um, but a few of you may know me from my recording days in Denver or even further back than that in Bakersfield. And some of you may have just been introduced to me in March when I put out a story with the help of Kristen and Sonia um, after my time at Nine News. Um, it was called Latinx, and it got a lot of traction. Uh, in our introduction, it mentions that it helps your head and sort of contribute to a national conversation about more Latinos and more representation in news and in media. And that's been such an exciting thing. Kristen and I got a chance to be honored by the National Association of Hispanic Journalists just earlier this week. And what that really led to was helping to set new standards of immigration coverage um, at dozens of different uh, news stations across the country now. So I love that Speaking Out has resulted in just so many amazing outcomes and I'm really, really honored and humbled to get to be here with all of you today, just continuing to sow that Latina power and strength back into you and get it from all of you today too. I'm, I'm so excited to be here with all of you. And what I learned from this piece especially is how much stronger we are when we stand oh. together. Right, Kristen, we've said that so many times. I mean, for Kristen, I mean, look at her, you're such an inspiration. Uh, talk about strength and determination. I, I'm truly inspired every single time I think of your story and how much you've overcome in the last year. Girl, this year has been crazy oh, for all of us. And I do feel stronger standing next to you and our girl, Sonia. Um, so for those of you who don't know you, again, you might remember me from my Denver days reporting and anchoring for Nine News. Well, during my time there, I actually had an ischemic stroke. Now, I know what you're thinking. How does someone so young and dynamic have a stroke? But girl, it can happen. It had happened to me. I had an ischemic stroke and it left the entire left side of my body completely paralyzed. So these past two years have been wild, and mainly because I've been recovering from that, right? I had to learn how to use my entire left side of my body and um, really had to learn from scratch how to feed myself, how to tie my shoes, which is still a little bit of an issue. But really, I've been able to focus on my strength, leaning on God, my faith, my family, and my friends like Lori here. And of course, my Latina sisters who are always writing into me, supporting me, and reminding me that I can do it. Because that is in our blood, right? To just keep persevering and pushing. It makes me so proud to be a Latina. And Lori, I am so excited to be here today and support and empower our Latina sisters across Colorado and really across the nation. And of course, I know Kristen and I both remain extremely connected to Colorado, even though we're both coming to you virtually from totally different places. I'm in Philadelphia. Uh, Kristen, you're not in Asheville even right now. Where are you coming to us from, Chicago? No, I'm actually in Chicago. It's also my sister's uh, wedding shower today, but she was kind enough to let me do this. I was like, listen, I got to do this. She's like, oh, it's for Latinas? Yeah, be late. It's fine. I mean, I was going to be late anyways. But yeah, so I'm in Chicago right now. <laughs> So even, even though neither of us is based out of Colorado right now, our connections that we made with the Latino community and with all of our other communities that we got involved with there, reporting stories, and just from a personal 
perspective, um, those connections have remained extremely strong. So we're so excited it's to get to connect deep, with you really. this way virtually today. <laughs> All right, are y'all ready? Yeah? So before we continue with our inspiring program, let's take a moment to hear from you, our audience. Participate now in this quick poll, okay? Well, I know that I find my strength to be a Latina leader from my community, be it my family or any number of you. Are we ready to start the program? Today yes. is about inspiring, uplifting, and celebrating the Latina voice and our journey. So, vamos, let's get going. Please welcome Vice President of Philanthropy for LCFC, the beautiful, the one, the only, Rachel Brier. Woo! It takes unwavering par partnerships from both. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Rachel. I'll stop talking. For Good morning. <laughs> Buenos dias y bienvenidos a todos. Welcome to the fifth annual Latinas Lead Power Summit. My name is Rachel Griego, and I'm the Vice President of Philanthropy for the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado, LCFC. Launched in 2016, Latinas Lead exists to strengthen the development of Latinas so that they can drive social change. We do this through our Latinas Lead Power Summit, our virtual leadership series, and our newly piloted Maestra session, our version of Masterclass. And finally, through our Latinas Lead Giving Circle, which is powered by your small personal donations. Each year, the Giving Circle distributes $10,000 to small organizations throughout the state of Colorado. These small organizations are dedicated to growing the professional and the uh, personal leadership of Latinas. Today, we make space to amplify the stories of these many amazing Latinas y también a courageous hermano, who will share with you the fierceness, strength, beauty, and often the struggle of our journey to make sense of our identity. Before I continue, I would like to thank and recognize our sponsors, Colorado Housing and Finance Authority, CHAFA, Colorado Health Foundation, Molson Coors Beverage Company, Excel Energy, Denver Metro Chamber Foundation, and our longstanding partner, the Denver Center for Performing Arts, DCPA, who has supported and hosted the Power Summit for the last three years. Without these investments and their commitment to supporting the Latino community, this program would not be possible. I would also like to thank and acknowledge all the behind the scenes work, the tireless work and patience of our staff, our committed partners, Neocom Promo, Community Language Cooperative, YAMS Graphic Design, and our newest partner, Unico Communications, who helped us produce this event. It really does take a village. Today, I want each of you to commit to being 100% present. My hope is that through the power of storytelling, you will gain the confidence, strategies, and new learnings that will help you both personally and professionally. Today is about connecting, connecting to a community of powerful Latinas. I recently read that when we all allow ourselves to indulge in connection, like we're doing today, it's like magic. I water you, you water me, and we never drain each other. Today, I encourage you to listen, to be patient with yourself, and to reflect and engage with one another. Use the live chat feature to connect with us. Introduce yourself and share with us what you think about the speakers and the messages in today's program. Today, I want each of you to become a storyteller for this ever-changing world. I want each of you to affirm and understand the power and the weight of your thoughts and of your words. Finally, I want each of you to know 
that curating this event continues to be a labor of love for me. The development of this power summit is guided by the voice of my ancestor and the wisdom of the rich and vibrant Latinas here in Colorado and beyond. Thank you once again for taking this journey with me. Let us always water one another. Now, help me in welcoming one of today's generous supporters from the Colorado Housing and Finance Authority, CHAFA, the Director of Human Resources, Debbie Herrera. Thank you, Rachel. Hi, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here on CHAFA's behalf. At CHAFA, our mission is to strengthen Colorado by investing in affordable housing and community development. In 2020, the pandemic only made the need for affordable housing and assistance for local businesses even greater. On top of that, communities of color were impacted more significantly. CHAPA's commitment to diversity, inclusion, and equity had long been established and we were already working on ways in which we can better serve communities of color. This included offering more of our home ownership resources in Spanish, including a new website, website called Mi Agar that helps guide prospective homeowners through the journey of home ownership. CHAPA's efforts have helped reach more Latinos, making home ownership possible. And in fact, 37% of CHAPA's home ownership customers are Latino. In addition, CHAPA offers, offers business finance programs for business owners. And in 2020, 32% of CHAPA's business customers were women owned, 20% were minority owned, and 4% were women minority owned. As you can see, our organization's missions are well aligned, and we've been so honored to be community partners and support your work. Most recently, CHAFA contributed $1 million to support IOTA Colorado and the Communities of Color Loan Fund, which strengthens Latinos, immigrant and refugee nonprofits following the impact of COVID-19. This is just one example of the many amazing opportunities you provide to create opportunities for Latino leaders and those they serve in Colorado. Speaking of leaders, I would love to acknowledge Carlos Martinez. Your ability to build community and lift other people up is awe-inspiring, and I thank you for your leadership example. And of course, I would love to also to acknowledge Kali Parado Einstein, author of Sabrina and Karina. It is a pleasure to be here with you today as Chapa is also reading your book in the fall as part of our book club. Lastly, I offer a few thoughts on how we show up as leaders. I encourage all of you to use your voice and influence for the greater good. It takes courage and perseverance to truly be authentic in how we show up in this work. And sometimes that means embracing uncomfortable experiences, but I think we can all acknowledge and remember that change never happens when we are comfortable. And so on behalf of CHAPA, thank you so much for this opportunity and I celebrate all of you in your leadership journey. Now representing our longtime Power Summit partner, Denver Center for Performing Arts, please welcome their Executive Director of Education and Community Engagement, Allison Watrous. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone to the Latinas Lead Power Summit from the stage at the Sewell Ballroom at the Denver Center for the Performing Arts. My name is Allison Watrous. I'm the Executive Director of Education and Community Engagement here at the Denver Center. And we have absolutely been honored to partner with LCFC for over three years, working together to bolster and build community and connection through hosting community events, several nights at the theater, impactful conversations, scholarships, tickets, and sharing the stories of both organizations. Community is truly at the heart of LCFC, and obviously community has been such an important journey for all of us this year, and I'm so grateful to partner with LCFC and their incredible mission. Thank you for your leadership and for truly embodying what it means to authentically build a sense of belonging and connection. Your partnership really means the world to us here at the DCPA. We are thrilled to partner on the Latinas Lead Power Summit for, the th for three years to celebrate, empower, and ensure Latina leadership in Colorado, Denver, and beyond. Thank you so much, and just so grateful to be a part of this mission. Have a wonderful summit.
So it takes unwavering partnerships from both the nonprofit and the private sector to ensure that programs like today's Power Summit are available for the community and provide a lasting impact. Thank you all for all your support and this hard work. Our next speaker created She Grows, We Grow, a global community of women of color who embrace and affirm their individual voice and power. Welcome tra Trailblazer and founder Christina Garcia. Hello everyone. My name is Christina Garcia and I'm an educator, mentor, and the founder of She Grows, We Grow. I'm super excited to be here today. It's my honor and my pleasure to come to you straight from uh, Los Angeles, California. I first and foremost wanna give my deep gratitude to the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado for this amazing Power Summit event that brings together these amazing trailblazers from all walks of life. It's an honor truly to be here. I wanna to start today by telling you a little bit about my story um, because I think it's important that I, number one, tell you who I am, where I come from, uh, what makes you, what makes me who I am and who are my people, right? Uh, who and what has made it possible for me to be here today? Um, and then I also want to share a little bit about my work, right? How I, how She Grows, We Grow came to be, what it means to me, the philosophy behind it. And last, I want to leave you with a message that I hope you will take with you, um, into your work, into your schools, into your disruption spaces throughout your life. So first of all, I love to introduce myself in every speaking engagement, every presentation I do, any space I have access to as the daughter of immigrants. For me, it's so important to bring my entire family to the table with me, my people, my grandparents, the people that created and molded and shaped me. It's important to bring them to the table with me today because they didn't have the opportunities I've had because they were struggling and working toward me being able to be here today. And so not only am I the descendant of immigrants, I'm also the descendant of people who were here four, if not five generations ago. And by here, I mean the North American continent where my grandparents who were both Bracero workers cultivated the land and essentially helped build this nation. Both of my grandfathers came in with the Bracero program of 1942, which brought to the United States over 5 million Mexican workers from Mexico. This is the largest program of foreign workers in US history. And I'm proud that my family and my extended family, primas and cousins and tias were, are able to be here because of that. But it's also not remiss on me that because they came, built this nation up, we are of this land, all of us, including yourselves. I also wanna tell you a little bit about my political upbringing, my activism, and that I have to credit Chicago, my first home and my first love. I also have to credit El Paso, Texas, where I hail from, yes. So I'm a product of the South side of Chicago, but I'm also the product of the border with Mexico. And why do I tell you these things? because I want you to not, not only relate to me, but I want you to know specifically what makes me proud to be here. And I also do this to honor those that have come before me. All my teachers, all those wise women in my life who have given me consejos, who have told me, mija, you're gonna encounter this along the way, hazle así, hazle asá, all of that. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what I was doing in Chicago. I was walking the streets, marching with my father at the age of like eight years old. My dad was my first teacher, the first person that sat down with me at the kitchen table to teach me how to read and write in Espanol, eh? 
because you couldn't not speak Spanish in my household. You had to embrace both your cultures, specifically your mother culture of where you come from. So I'm super proud of that today. And I think this is an excellent segue into my work and tell you a little bit about what, what I do with my She Grows, We Grow community. She Grows, We Grow came, was born out of a deep desire to be able to radicalize the way that we think about self, to be able to do deep exploration of ourselves, to be able to go inside and unpack all that our identities bring to the table. And by unpack, I really mean looking internally at ourselves, doing the critical questions, asking the critical questions of who am I? Who are you? At your core, in the depths of your soul, who are you? Do you know yourself? Do you know what you stand for? What you're about? Do you know your value system? What's important to you? Who are your people? I ask these thought-provoking questions in all the spaces that I'm allowed into <laughs> or that I just disrupt and get into myself. Um, I really wanted women, but specifically Black, Indigenous, and women of color to do the deep exploration work as a way toward liberation, as a way to reclaim all that rightfully belongs to us as a way to assert ourselves in a world and a society that continuously tells us that we don't belong. I do this work, this, this spirit born work because I've gone through all of these challenges myself. I've been that young Latina brown girl in a room full of whiteness that I felt I didn't belong in. I've gone through academia, yes. I was lucky enough to go through, privileged enough to be able to have access to higher education, yes. But it wasn't full of conflict, some trauma, right? And a lot of othering, right? A lot of othering, not just of my own person, but of my parents and my peers and my neighbors and my comunidad. When you other them, you other me. And so I, saw and looked for what could, what message could I bring to women like myself, to other Latinas that, that are seeking and yearning something way beyond what you were told is success, right? In this nation, unfortunately, forces of capitalism and patriarchy have told us that success is owning a house, getting a car, getting those shiny degrees on your wall, right? Getting married, et cetera. And while all those things are important and they're critical, right? We sh those shouldn't be prescribed to us. Those things should not be expected from us in order to achieve success. Success should be defined the way we want to define success as shaped by yourselves. And so for me, the work of liberation and reclamation is pivotal, pivotal, because I believe that if we don't truly know ourselves at our core, if we don't truly, truly embrace all of who we are, then others will never be able to see us. Others will never, they already don't accept us in many spaces, right? But when we walk sure of who we are in our element, in our essence, in our power, and use our voice to claim that space, guess what? There's nothing in the world that will other you. There's nothing in the world that will tell you who you are because you are telling them who you are. And that's key. We have so many harmful narratives so many stereotypes, so many stories about who we are. For me, it's important that we make a claim to who we wanna be as defined by ourselves, not as defined by others. 
And so for me, in the work that I do with She Grows, We Grow, the mentorship and education work that I do, this is a question I ask women everywhere. Those narratives that you have in your head, those stories, who gave them to you? Where do they come from? Are they yours? Or did somebody put them there? Was that conditioning? Was that perhaps toxic cultural beliefs and or stereotypes about your community? It's important that we answer those questions before we can walk through life with, you know, really, really empowered and really sure of who we are. And so this brings me to my next, my message to you. My message to you is that in order for us to return to harmony, we have to really do the work of self-love. Self-love and self-compassion. It starts there, mujeres. And I do want to invo invoke my teacher, Sonia Renee Taylor, for this. If you haven't heard of her, please Google her immediately. She is amazing and she has radicalized the notion of self-love as pertaining to black women and women of color. For me, first and foremost, we have to have the ability to forgive ourselves. And so the work of self-exploration, of liberation, of dismantling oppression from within is first and foremost about being able to forgive ourselves. Being able to forgive ourselves for assimilation, for being self-oppressive at times, for following the crowd because we didn't want to stand out, for not allowing ourselves to shine our light because it would be too disruptive, too loud. We've all done this. You all know what I'm talking about. You've all experienced that moment when you said to yourself, I'm not gonna ruffle any feathers. I'm just gonna go with the flow, right? Well, I'm here to tell you, no, that is not working for us, mujeres. And what we need to do is yes, do the exploration work, but very intimately sit with ourselves and, and cultivate that radical self-love that Sanya tells us about. That radical love that makes you not just look at yourself, but look at yourself in the context of your community. It's a revolutionary approach to how you see your own body and others, other bodies in the world. When you activate your self-love muscle, you walk into a room asking yourself, where are all the other women that don't look like me? You're thinking of the most marginalized and oppressed people and you're asking, where are they? Why aren't they here with me? So not only are we thinking about ourselves with this approach, right? And in the process, we are breaking down this myth of individualism, another tenet of white supremacy, another tenet of capitalism. And so I'm asking for you, I'm leaving you with this message. I want you to go home today. I want you to go home and ask yourself the question, who am I? at my core, you don't have to share it with anybody yet until you're ready. Who are you and what are the things that I have just, what are the things that I haven't loved about myself and why? What are those messages that I keep playing out? The goal here is to enter in a, into a liberatory state of self-expression and self-determination, where you live your lives on your own account, by your own doing, by your own prescription, and you're not playing out these narratives that sit in our psyche and that have tortured us for way too long. And so yes, embrace all of who you are, let your hair down, wear that red lipstick, be that loud Latina, be it. Because guess what? We are not we're not getting any smaller. Our time is here. Our time is now. Grab it, run with it. I encourage you to follow my work at She Grows, We Grow. 
I have a mentorship program. I have a lot of educational videos online and I'm so happy to have been given the opportunity to be here with you today. Thank you. Representing our sponsor and longtime committed foundation supporter, help me in welcoming one of Colorado Biz's top 25 young professionals of 2021, Kayla Garcia, Community Affairs Director for Molson Coors Beverage Company. Hi, I'm Kayla Garcia with Molson Coors Beverage Company. For nearly 150 years, we've been brewing our beers right here in Colorado, and we will continue to brew and invest in our communities for years to come, as Colorado is a cornerstone to our history and our heritage. At Molson Coors, we invest nearly $1 million annually in Latino communities across the U.S. to drive social change and ensure our voices are heard. That is why we are proud to partner with the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado and Latinas Lead Power Summit to advance our community and to continue to give us Latinas the platform we need to lead the way. From growing up in my hometown of Pueblo, Colorado, to being a first-generation college student at Colorado State University, Fort Collins, I was always looking ahead to my big city dreams and goals. I never thought that one day this Latina would be a leader in my community. I knew I would be. Now, the confidence and determination that you hear in my voice today has not always been the case. In fact, it's a continuous professional and personal leadership development I'm constantly working towards. My network, my mentors, and inspirational and critical learning such as today is what keeps me motivated, what keeps allowing my voice to get stronger, and what keeps me dreaming those big, achievable dreams. On behalf of Molson Coors, we thank you for letting us be a part of your journey as you continue to lead us now and into the future. Our next speaker is the curating founder behind a network of hermanas that began in Dallas and is quickly gaining momentum around Texas. Their guiding philosophy is building a community with liberation, empowerment, and connection in mind and heart through the power of sisterhood. Let's learn a little more about Hey Chica. My experience at Hey Chica has been electrifying. The energy of having hundreds of empowered young Latinas in the room is contagious. We're not here to compete with each other, we're here to help each other. This movement really helps me live my truth. What we do is we shine a light on women from all walks of life. The women who are about change, the women who are about making this world a better place, who are about living their dreams and activating their faith. That's the culture that I'm in and that's where I want to be. There is a movement of Latinas here that is taking over the country. I can't say enough about joining hands with a bunch of powerful women. Together we can change the world. Hey Chicas, it's Veronica Torres Hazley here with the Hey Chica Movement. And I'm so honored to be here as a speaker today, highlighting the experience of the Hey Chica Movement and the power of sisterhood. I know that during these times, a sisterhood is the most important thing that we can give. And with the Hey Chica Movement, I hope that our story and how we started inspires you to tag along. The Hey Chica Movement was started almost four years now and was started behind a group of women who wanted to pour in. There was a group of us in Dallas, Texas, that really wanted leadership, but for us and by us, similar to today's summit. It was about bringing our hermanas together and bringing speakers and our friends and comadres together to teach each other life lessons on how we can be great. As you all know, 
in our Hispanic community, we thrive on community. We thrive on a village raising all of our children. We thrive on our virtual and non-virtual experiences with our families. The Hey Chica movement is no different. I was raised by entrepreneur grandparents that really taught me that giving back to my community, hard work, and family were the most important things in our life. And with the Hey Chica movement, we built the same thing. We decided that we were gonna build our own leadership program that we would invite our own culture into the boardroom and we would honor it by inviting women who wanted to start a sisterhood and not hate on other women, not bring other women down. And it just turned into something that we call the movement. The movement now is spreading throughout the state of Texas and hopefully coming to Denver soon. But the movement is about women showing up showing up for other women, whether it's in the corporate boardroom or in their neighborhood community gatherings, or maybe it's a single mom to another single mom. It's showing up and saying that I am gonna see you, I'm gonna witness your life, and I'm gonna be there for it. But it's also pouring in, just like any other Hispanic family, the village that gives, right? My grandmother used to always send me to her friend down the street to go get the best tortillas or to go to the store next door and support and get some pan dulces. That's the way that Hey Chica is. It's going to the best, bringing them home, and then sharing with the family. That's sort of the ethos behind Hey Chica. And Hey Chica, creatively speaking, the name itself was like, hey girl, I see you, let me put you in the game. It's no different from our talks that we have with our girlfriends or our family. It's just actually acknowledging each other and really taking the time to get to know each other so we can help you grow, so we can put you in the game, so that in giving, we know that the return comes back to us and amplifies our life's purpose. So today, for this next few minutes, I wanna to talk to you about your life's purpose and how your Hey Chica movement can be yours and whatever it is that you're doing. We know that now during these times, it's very hard to connect with people and this is just another modality on how to do that. And I'm hoping that we all stay connected and that we're all inspiring, they're all listening to the life experiences from all these amazing women that are gonna influence you to take a bold step to grow your family, or to climb up that career path that you've always wanted. That's the Hey Chica mantra, that's the movement. It gives me chills just thinking about the inspiration that comes naturally when you're doing good. And when you're not hating on someone else or you're not bringing another hermana down, but you're actually lifting her up to inspire her, to push her past her limits, her fears. How do we do that? And how do we do it now during these post-COVID times? Or how do we get that energy or that passion to get out of bed, not just inspire ourselves, but inspire a tribe of women? It starts with us. It starts in here. It starts with ganas. It starts with being a poderosa and speaking up and speaking your truth. It starts with finding your own tribe of chicas wherever you're at and inviting them to speak their authentic truth. I think that's where I get most of my love and most of my energy to get up in the next day and say, what else can we do? The Hey Chica movement is about gathering women for networkers like Tacos and Chill. It's about pouring into high school girls that we do call Hey Chiquita or the Chica Code giving our young girls a pathway and a pipeline to grow into leadership. Where is that for us as Latinas? The Hey Chica movement brings that to life. It brings high school girls together to learn about self-care, self-love, self-compassion, from our book club to our beauty and podcasting series. 
than to our mighty, mighty professional Latina that is still trying to figure out where she's gonna navigate the next best thing. I was that girl. I worked for corporate America. I saw what was happening in the boardrooms, what was happening in politics outside our doors. And I knew that there was something else and there was something missing. There was something missing. And for me, it was that other Latina that was in the boardroom with me. That was not happening. So Hey Chica brings that to life. It actually pours in and develops a platform for us to put more Latinas on boards in executive positions, in leadership roles. Chica's in charge. That's what Hey Chica does for professional women. Hey Chica is also about our legacy. Our poderosas, our women who have these rich, rich cultural truths that want to leave a legacy behind and share that from the recipes to the amazing food that we eat to the stories and her struggles that are going to go heard and not unheard. Our poderosa women are the women who have taken the fight to stand up for something. And as a Hey Chica, we say we see you. Thank you for paving the way for us, for developing this pipeline. So now that we have our high school girls, our professional women, and our legacy builders, a way to go. We're handing them the light to stand tall, stand, stand proud, to really be in our cultural truth without negotiating who we really are and our values, but showing up in the boardroom proud, strong, motivated. That's the Hey Chica. So when you hear Hey Chica, Hey Chica, Hey Chica, when you see things, even after today, you could see things that we've showed you that we've built, it all came from a place of lack and is now abundant. Now there's chicas all over the country that want to get involved. How can I be a part of that thing that you're doing? Well, it's not a thing. It's a movement that you can be a part of, that we can grow together and that we can invest in. It takes a lot to go against the grain, I know. I was that girl. But it, once it's there, and once we have a pathway and an acceptance to who we are, then it's limitless. We can start our own business. We can raise our kids. We can show up however we want in our authentic, powerful truth. And guess what? We are the next best thing. We are the consumers buying. We are the number one small business that's thriving and growing right? It's the chicas. We're making decisions. And for once in our life, we're making decisions for ourselves and for our hermana next to us. And we're all coming along as a tribe of one. I hope that this summit has brought so many different stories for you to learn from and for you to say, hey, I'm going to start my own story. And I invite you to do that. There's nothing more powerful than starting your own movement. And when you do, because I know you will, I hope that you have a chica right there next to you. And I hope that you create your own movement. Because opportunity is out there for all of us, and we'll see that more and more. But when preparation meets opportunity, that is powerful. So hey, chica, I invite you to start your own movement join the sisterhood, celebrate you, celebrate your life and your family with purpose, and don't be afraid when you see a chica in your workplace, in your community, perhaps in a boardroom, celebrate her. Give her the message. Tell her, hey, chica, I see you. And stand tall and proud because we're coming. We're coming with legions of chicas, excited, ready, to pour into you. Thank you for listening. I hope to connect with you guys still in the chat. Stay engaged. And we're here to celebrate you, mujer. As always, viva la chica.
¡Ay, Dios! ¡Qué honor! ¡Dios! <laughs> ¡Poderosas! I mean, wow, that is so amazing. I'm not kidding. I'm literally sitting here taking notes on what these amazing women are saying. So, mm -hmm. now, we have a unique piece to share with you all, mujeres. Get ready. This presentation is going to be so, so powerful. It is one I've really been looking forward to. Over the course of the last month or so, you may have been part of creating and contributing to this artistic segment via social media. We asked you, what does being a Latina mean to you? What you didn't know is that we gathered your responses and had ally illustrator and graphic artist Brian Montes create an original one-of-a-kind artistic piece that not only captures your intentions and responses to the question, but it also serves as the backdrop for his amazing mother, Lourdes Teresa's personal story. Watch and listen as Brian creates this one-of-a-kind piece and Lourdes shares her story. Hola, uh, mi nombre es María Lourdes Terrazas. Uh, yo nací el 8 de junio de 1978 uh, y llegué a los Estados Unidos en el 2000 con mi hijo de dos años. Ser latina um, representa estar orgulloso de tus raíces um, y luchar en un país donde somos minoría. Entonces, um, yo estoy muy orgullosa de ser latina, pero eso conlleva luchar día a día um, por, por tener igualdad, por um, que no queden atrás sus raíces, englobar todo sabiendo que eres latina y saliendo a trabajar todos los días um, para sobrevivir en un país diferente. Tus raíces, tu cultura, tu comida, a seguir teniendo todo eso que te, que te caracteriza el ser latino en este país. A aprender las costumbres de aquí, pero sin olvidarte de, de tus cosas que te definen como latino. Que teniendo desventaja por ser inmigrante latino, hay que hacer las cosas mejor para sobresalir. Porque si nos conformamos con ciertas cosas, vamos a hacer exactamente lo que hacen los demás. Entonces trato de enfocarme muy bien en mi trabajo, con mi familia. Um, trato de siempre mostrar el por qué soy latina y el por qué le estoy ofreciendo algo diferente. Um, en eso pienso siempre, en tratar de sobresalir sin olvidarme de mis raíces. El consejo que yo les daría es que um, aunque hayan nacido en, en Estados Unidos, Uh, siempre tengan sus raíces bien apegadas, sus costumbres y su gente. Uh, y siempre estén muy orgullosos de decir, somos latinos. Para todos el orgullo latino es no avergonzarse de que venimos de otro país y que no importa en qué circunstancias debemos resaltar nuestras costumbres y no importa lo que piensen los demás. Somos latinos y somos orgullo latino. Cuando empecé, bueno, yo siempre tenía una idea de no trabajar para nadie, pero era muy difícil y me sentía sola, pedí ayuda y pues nadie me ayudó, tuve que, tuve que hacer las cosas como yo pensaba que eran, tuve que aprender a hacerlas un poquito de otra manera para que pudiera tener éxito. Ah, poco a poco fue dando resultado con ayuda de una y que otra persona aquí y allá y después descubrí un mundo totalmente diferente que vi que trabajar para mí misma, el dinero era para mí, uh, todas las ganancias eran para mí, después tuve que contratar gente porque sola yo no podía hacer tanto trabajo y después encontré la manera de 
de sobresalir un poco y, y tener una vida mejor. Se siente, me siento muy orgullosa de que yo manejo mi tiempo, yo manejo mis ganancias y trato de dar el mejor servicio para todo el mundo. Latinas Divinas engloba tu color de piel, tu forma de ser, um, que no importa cuántas dificultades tenemos cada día, estamos ahí, estamos luchando, eh, nuestras, nuestra cultura, nuestro color de piel, nuestro trabajo, somos luchadoras, somos divinas. Wow. My, my, you, I'm on three. Okay. Wow, guys. So powerful, right? Oh my gosh. I love that. It's a perfect place for us to maybe take a little bit of a break. Can you believe we are halfway through this incredible program? And I think we all deserve just a little power break. So go refresh your coffee, stretch out your legs, get a little snack, go pee. That's what I'm going to doing. But we'll be back here in five minutes.
Welcome back, everyone. Bienvenido de nuevo. I don't know about you, but I am still thinking about where I'm going to put that beautiful Somos Divinas sticker. I have one from Kristen, actually, already on my water bottle, but it may need to go on the other side or something. Um, so before we resume with the program, we take a quick moment to be nosy and ask you all, where will you wrap your Somos Divinas sticker? Love the music. <laughs> well, welcome back, everyone. I vo I vote for needing one everywhere, and I was actually thinking, Lori, about the stickers I bought us, and I think it's going to fit perfectly right there. Lori and I have long been crazy Latinas, women supporters, so that sticker is going to be perfect there. Well, mm -hmm. I also might need an extra one, right, to put on my Frida, my dog. Her, her name's Frida obsessed with her and if you follow me on social media you know her so she's not with me she's at the babysitter's house back in north carolina but look at that face my little baby so she needs one she's a strong latina too she needs one on her water on her water bowl water bowl yes exactly yeah but well, we need to get one on the collar especially made she's a proud latina i can tell my baby knows she's mexican <laughs> all right well let's get back into our program so each year, Latinas Lead presents an accomplished Latina who exemplifies the value of this program, one who is strong-willed, vibrant, and contributes her authentic voice, talent, and innovative spirit to leadership, one who gives back to the community, and one who serves as a role model to others. Well, this year's awardee exemplifies all of these values and so many more. To help us introduce this year's honoree, it's my sincere pleasure to welcome a well-accomplished and powerful Latina in her own right and a dear friend of mine, Denver City Councilwoman, Jamie Torres. Yay. Thank you so much, Lori. And my mask is stuck in my earring. <laughs> Big hoops, gotta have them. Um, today, I would like to present the 2021 Latinas Lead Influencer Award to an amazing woman uh, who exemplifies the values of the Latina Lead Program and encapsulates the values of leadership, education, family, and philanthropy. Senadora Julie Gonzalez. She knows the importance of and understands the need for strengthening the leadership pipeline of Latinas. She regularly lends her voice and influence across important causes and has created opportunities that have led to the development of future leaders. Senator Gonzalez is, to me, as humble, brilliant, funny, and truth-telling a Chicana as you will ever find. But she doubles down on that by putting in the work. She talks about good policy, and then she goes and builds it. She listens to what community has to say, and then she makes sure that that's echoed in the halls of government or from the bullhorn at the front of a rally. I once heard Cornell West say, you can't lead the people if you don't love the people. And Senator Gonzalez lives that out. Whether in the state capitol, carrying 41 bills this year, 95% of which made it to the governor's desk, creating a phone bank to call elders when the pandemic started, helping organize and deliver 18 vaccination clinics in 2021 with the Jefas, or strategize about the future. Her compass points to love. It points to elevating honesty, and it points to celebrating culture and community. Please help me in celebrating 
this year's Latinas Lead Influencer Award to my friend, La Senadora Julie Gonzalez. Jamie, Conce Concejal, Council Member Torres, thank you so much. As a fellow jefa, it's just an honor um, to be recognized and acknowledged in this way. Girl, you're making me cry. I'm gonna, my eyeliner is just out the window now. It's all good. <sighs> I wanna thank the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado and all of the conveners and sponsors of the Latinas Lead Power Summit for this beautiful recognition. What an honor to be acknowledged. I want to speak about the ways in which we often are asked to be strong, to be resilient, to be grateful. And I also wanna encourage us in these difficult moments to also be vulnerable, to also allow ourselves to be angry and to use those emotions to tap into the energy as well as we continue our work to build structural equity and justice. Those of y'all who know me know that I have said this many, many times, that crisis exacerbates inequality. And we have seen that inequality laid bare over the past 18 months. Whether we're talking about the pandemic, whether we're talking about the racial reckoning, whether we're talking about the climate crisis, we're talking about the economic recession. We have seen the ways in which the haves have got along just fine, while the have-nots are struggling more than ever. Let us not pretend that things were great in the before times, but the pandemic and all of those crises have laid bare all of the ways in which we have to, we've got to fight. The Latinas Lead Power Summit is an opportunity for us to reflect on this moment that we're in. And I want to take a moment to just really think about the word power itself. Power is the ability to act. When I was a little chicanita, I was told that if I got good grades, that if I got a college education, that I would be able to achieve the American dream. I actually got myself into Yale through the hard work of my mother and my father who struggled hard. My mom dropped out of high school, got her GED, became a teacher, taught me in second grade, and then sent her daughter to, to Yale. But what I learned at that institution is that power is often concentrated in the hands of those haves. What do you do if you don't have that money or those resources? If you organize enough people, you can actually balance those inequities, you can actually transform the nature of power itself. You too can act. And that's what I've done my entire life, is to find people who are grateful, find people who are angry, find people who are strong, find people who are willing to be vulnerable. And when we work together, Y'all, yeah, that's when we're unstoppable. 
being able to work alongside the jefas. We, we joke about how transformative, how special, how rare it is to be surrounded by like-minded women who are doing everything that we can to harness power and to use it on behalf of our community. Yeah, I never thought I'd run for office because I spent more time actually protesting outside the Capitol than I spent inside of it. But, <laughs> but here I am at, at the tail end of my third legislative session, a year in which two days before uh, our session began, we had a triple funeral in my family because because of this, the impacts of the, of the pandemic, to see my husband mourn his mother, his uncle, and his grandfather reminded me and framed this entire legislative session that we don't do this work in a vacuum, that the work that we do is inside the Capitol is as important as the work that we do outside of it. And so that's why, in addition to running 41 bills, on nights and weekends, we were out there organizing those equity clinics to ensure that people did not have to navigate the pain that so many in our Latino community have had to navigate. I'm proud of the work that we've accomplished. And y'all, we're just getting started. What an honor to be surrounded by so many fierce jefas, so many fierce chingonas, so many fierce Latinas. What a blessing. This is what power looks like. And I'm so, so grateful. Thank you all for this recognition. Mm. Julie, you are amazing and absolutely incredible. I know I looked up to you during my time in Denver and still do. You're so brave, fierce, and courageous with your leadership. I do want to take another quick moment to thank and recognize our, spot, our Power sponsor, Summit sponsors, and they include the Colorado Housing and Finance Authority, Chafa, the Molson Coors Beverage Company, Excel Energy, Denver Metro Chamber Leadership Foundation, and our partners, the Denver Center for Performing Arts, DCPA. We could not have brought you guys, these incredible women, to your screens right now without the help and support of our community sponsors. Speaking of incredible women, I mean, we just have so many. Our next speaker is a lifelong advocate and social justice pioneer. She's a climate change warrior, incredible, committed to amplifying the Latinx community's strong, deep relationship to the environment, which has been passed down through indigenous African and agrarian roots. She, she has strong querencia, or soul's longing to, for place. So help me welcome climate justice warrior, Sorisa Luciero. I'm often asked, where am I from? To which I usually just say, from here. Then the person will ask me, well, where are your parents from? To which I say, from here. At that point, they look a little confused or think I am, and will just come right out and ask, well, what's your heritage? Where is your family from? At that point, I take the opportunity to talk a little bit about history. See, my family didn't cross any borders. The borders crossed us. For 350 years before the US laid claim to the Southwest, there were interactions between the native peoples of the Americas, Africans, and Europeans that gave rise to a whole new people that we insufficiently call Hispanic or Latinx. And if you were to answer the census, what races would you mark? Too often, Hispanic or Latino is counted as white, erasing our indigenous and African roots. But you can't erase that. 
It's in our culture. It's in our heritage. It's in our music. It's in our dancing. It's in our spirituality, our food, and our medicine. And it's in our carencia, or our souls belonging to place. If you want to engage the Latino community on its environmentalism, you have to go to where it lives. Stopping climate change starts with the heart. In Spanish, there's a phrase, y que, and it means basically, and what? But more in use, it's so what? So climate change, y que, why does it matter? Why does climate change matter to the Latinx community? And why does the Latinx community matter to the larger climate change movement? You see, 80% of us already believe that climate change is happening, which is greater than the non-Latino community. And we're 20% of the population. We're also among its youngest. In fact, the environmental community has long seen how the future of the environment is intertwined with that of the Latino community. But nonprofit, government, and public sector interests are not well equipped to engaging our Latino community. They continually underestimate our level of passion, interest, and leadership, and wisdom in this area. 80% of Latinos already believe that climate change is happening. This is greater than the non-Latino population. And 20, we are 20% of the population of the United States, and we're among its youngest. In fact, environmental groups have long seen that the future of the Latino community and the future of the environment are intertwined. But the public, private, and nonprofit sectors are all ill-equipped to adequately engage the Latinx community. They consistently undervalue our level of interest, passion, leadership, and innovation in this area. And when they seek our vote, but not our leadership, they're disregarding the heritage of our wisdom. And when they label us as at risk or vulnerable, they disregard the resiliency of our story. In 1842, three men solicited the local prefect for 110,000 acres of lands used by the Apache, the Pueblo and Ute tribes. And it was to be used in collective by 35 families for agrarian purposes. One of those three men was my five times great grandfather. The land was awarded and the family started raising crops and animals and trying to make a life for themselves. My four times great grandfather had to petition Congress and the Supreme Court for the families to keep the land after the American Mexican American War. Unfortunately, he lost and the families lost the lands to which they've been working for decades. They were able to keep, however, the homesteads where they built their houses. I remember growing up to my grandmother telling stories about this ranch. Uh, my name is Maria Escobar. I was born in Cuesta, New Mexico. Uh, my recollection as a child living in Cuesta is of a small village of uh, neighbors knowing neighbors and helping one another. And it was a very small village. And the history of my grandparents is that they um, were given land at a land grant actually. Um, they had to prepare the acres, the, the many acres they gave them, which I think it was about 10 acres. They had to remove all the rocks and uh, take care of the earth and prepare it for planting. For we all lived off of the land by planting vegetables and um, just everything else that needed to be done to uh, survive. And they did that. They had, uh, they produced many vegetables, uh, fruit. Uh, we had, they had cattle, horses, chickens. So, um, that's how we, we lived off of the land. That's my memory of that, uh, of the culture. My grandmother, who was a curandera, um, was very knowledgeable in all the herbs, medicine, um, medicinal herbs that she gathered and which would she would have us children, her grandchildren, help her forage these plants in, in the forest, in the woods, and have us help her prepare them by 
cleaning them, drying them, and she would prepare them into different um, oils or medicine that, that she used to help the family when, when they were ill. She was our doctor, actually, uh, in the village. We're very uh, fortunate to have her there as she was the only one that I know of at the time took care of so many families and also brought in a lot of children into the world. That was, was the other thing she did. But my, my memory of my uh, grandparents' uh, ranch or, or farm, I don't know which way you want to call it, um, stayed in my mind because of all the things they had and we, um, but my mother and I would, and my uh, other sister would go and help them when they did their canning on, in the fall. And I'm talking about every kind of vegetable you can imagine. Uh, she would, they would can everything for winter. And so that stuck in my mind. And so I did a, a drawing of what I remember how it looked like. So I'm gonna need to go get it. <laughs> so if you can pause right there. Uh, down on the bottom, you can see a little tiny um, house-like sticking out of the ground. That was a chicken coop. And I remember going down there to gather the eggs, and it was so hot. But I loved gathering the eggs. And then in the middle of the courtyard of the yard, you'll see an orno, which is a, um, for they roasted ears of corn. That was a very nice time. However, due to drought and the closing of the local mine, my family migrated north to Colorado looking for work. Because they closed down the mines, there was no work. Uh, my father um, was able to get a work on the WTA, uh, WPA, there was called where they worked on the highways. But that wasn't enough money to, uh, to feed us, so since he kept coming back and forth to Colorado and to Wyoming to uh, uh, herd sheep, um, he got a contract at a farm here in um, Eaton, Colorado to do beets. So we came and did that in the summer, then went back again, but um, that, it was too hard anymore. So we just came back and stayed and lived here the rest of our lives. Despite tracing her lineage back to 1708, my grandmother and her family were greeted by signs that said no dogs or Mexicans in Colorado. And they were allowed only to live on the east side of the tracks in Eaton in an area nicknamed Ragtown. Well, and, and it's, a, it's a harsh word saying that Ragtown. It's really on the other uh, east of uh, Eaton where we were raised. Uh, we lived there for a few years, not very long, but um, people that we knew there were very kind, good, good people. We could actually leave our doors unlocked and not have to worry about uh, someone entering because that's how much um, we trusted one another. People were real good because like I said, we knew each other there and took care of one another again, just like we did in New Mexico. But that's the extent of it. Um, the rest of it, and going to school and um, being teased because we didn't speak English, uh, was not very nice. <laughs> so uh, that was our, our life over here. This history of redlining that officially and unofficially began in the 1930s has reverberations today. These are our frontline communities of climate change. These are our heat islands, our food deserts, and are the communities most likely to flood. It's where we have our worst air pollution or water delivered in lead pipes. I grew up in one of these red line neighborhoods in Denver. And while this story has been my own, it's not unique to me. And it's not just the common indigenous and agrarian and African roots that we all share. It's this cultural and natural inheritance that binds us from the past to the future. And we're the responsible stewards in the middle. And this is a commitment that can't be measured in the metrics of the traditional environmental movement. 
For example, we may not be recycling at the same rates as others, but we're reusing items like crazy. My grandmother is rewashing her plastic bottles and reusing them. And how many of us have the Doña Maria glassware set? While, my, uh, while we may not be adopting a ton of you know, EVs at the same rate as others, my aunt has one and she and I are trying to convince people that there's another kind of cool charger in town. And it's not just the Dodge one, but the kind that you plug your car into. And while we may not be always buying organic food, we are trying definitely to grow it with some calabazas or chilies in the backyard or cilantro in the windows, in the windowsill. The environmental movement is ours too. We have young leaders such as Jamie Margolin, Chidetska Martinez, and Shie Bastida. And we have veteran ones as well, like Ken Salazar and Federico Pena. We have incubators of innovation on the front lines of climate change with communities like Global Liria Swansea with the Grow House and Sun Valley with its eco district. Our innovation and leadership and our cultural inheritance are often diminished by, by many others. So let's not do the same. When I say environment, what do you think about? But when I say la tierra, what do you feel? When we talk about the health of the land, air, water, and food, what does that rise for you? When you think about climate change, what do you think of? But when you want to protect your sacred spaces, how do you feel? This isn't about English or Spanish or even language, really. It's about orientation. It's about a relationship to the environment. It's about talking to our hearts where the passion for the environment lives. And that's where it's also longer lasting. It's deeper and it's broader reaching. And that's really good because the time is really short and the need is too great to continue to rely on the same cohort of environmental champions that we've had to date. This has to be a people's movement. And to be a people's movement, it has to live in the heart. It's time for us to stop being spoken to about climate change and to engage in the conversation, to speak up ourselves. There's strength in our relationship to the land, air, water, and to our ancestors and our commitment to future generations and to the places that we cherish. There is wisdom in what Abuela ya lo sabe, what grandmother already knows. And it's also has wisdom in how we heal our bodies, our minds, and our spirits. We have to give ourselves permission to own our own story, our indigenous, our black, our agrarian roots, because this is our carencia, our inheritance for a love for the land. This is our strength, and Madre Tierra needs this strength. Our ancestors, young and future generations are counting on us. It is their call that we will answer because that is who we are. And if we want to stop climate change, we have to start with the heart. Wow, that's so beautiful. Madre Tierra learned so much from Lisa and her grandmother. I'm so glad she got to join her in helping us just impart so much wisdom and connecting to our environment really does lie in each of our hearts in different ways. And I, I think we all be looking at our relationship with the environment through a new lens, thanks to that perspective. Thank you both so much. Let's go ahead and move on to another poll. I've got a poll question for you here. Have you ever thought of yourself as a climate justice warrior?
The Expeditionist segment is one of my favorite recurring parts of the annual Power Summit. Now, I love all the different forms that it's taken over the past few years, but especially love that it contributes to building a strong Latina narrative. Now, each year, women have taken the stage and used storytelling to express their personal journeys, and they've shared how programs and projects funded by Latinas Lead Giving Circle have transformed their lives, helped in the development of their leadership, and given them the freedom to talk about their identity. Today, we'll hear from Bianca Godina, daughter, wife, student, poet, and artist from Roaring Forks, Colorado, who will share her story about the uncertainty of life during COVID. Bianca will share her story in Espanol. So for those who need translation, please refer to the live chat box for instructions. Welcome, Bianca. Bienvenidos. A lot changed from my 19th year to my 20th. As these years have passed, I have been built by each being with whom I have connected. As my 20 years have passed, I have left small traces of my being in many hearts. My heart, my essence, is made up of thousands of little pieces of other people. From my 19th year to my 20th, I learned that life is uncertain. The uncertainty is the current that guides life. I spent years living within the uncertainty that makes up anxiety, worrying about the what ifs and of the future that was to come. Thanks to life, today I know that I don't know if I will still be here tomorrow. And truth is, it doesn't concern me. From my 19th year to my 20th, I learned to create my goals and build my dreams one brick at a time, and most importantly, leave it in life's hands. From this life, I have learned to live my life one moment at a time because when I break down my expectations one by one, I allow myself to grow and I open the door to many unexpected surprises. From the rivers, I have learned to discard everything that is not healthy for me and everything that is alien to me. The way the river discards the hook that is thrown to its center. From the birds, I learned to fly freely, regardless of my hair color, regardless of my eye color, or how beautiful the song of my voice is. From the sunrises and the sun, I learned to shine no matter what is going on in the outside world. Because when I stop doubting myself, my light radiates. The earth has taught me that although uncertainty changes my path, the world continues to turn and that if I adapt to its rhythm, I will learn to pause for a moment and enjoy what at times appears to be a confinement while I paint, dance, sing. Life has taught me to appreciate all of the little pieces that make up my being. The love of my life told me that he began to believe in love at a distance because I always say that 1,000 kilometers dwindle when two souls are joined. If only he knew, I learned to say I love you when I met him. That the luxuries, the money, or any distance don't matter as long as you can share some good Doritos Negros at the foot of the river with the love of your life. My mom says she learned patience and confidence in herself from my grandpa, Joel. And if she knew that thanks to her, I aspire to be the patient mom that all of my life has answered my, and what ifs, and what is that? Does it exist? And that thanks to her, I know that life only presents you with one opportunity to make great decisions. And that if today my husband laughs with me because I snap my fingers to the sound of a good melody, it is because of her. Thanks to my dad, today I have my concentration face or I stick out my tongue when I play basketball or when I paint my nails because a little more lip always means more position. From my dad, I learned that people enjoy visit and love each other in life. And from my brother-in-law and my sister, I learned that there are little angels who come to teach us what it is to love and to have unity without being present in flesh and bone. My sister used to say that music speaks for people. And today I know that if I am willing to open my ears, even the wind's breeze will sing me its song. My brother said to leave the best of me wherever I step. And today, Empathy is one of my greatest allies. My grandma taught me, without saying a single word, that we must love and respect nature. If only she knew that thanks to her actions today, 
I am creating my own space to have my vibrant colored plants, and that because of her today, I give a bit of my affection to every homeless puppy I see in the street. My uncle Alonso used to say, thanks to my father God, when he pushed away his plate, signaling he had finished. And today, I know that if I lie down for a moment on a sidewalk at the plaza or the shore of the river, and I enjoy the gifts God has given me, I will be more grateful and a little bit closer to him. I am a mosaic. My heart has been made up of thousands of little pieces. But the beauty that I have today is thanks to each gift of themselves that other people have given me. Otras personas me han brindado de sí mismas. I love it when someone else can articulate feelings and emotions that I have, but maybe aren't able to communicate clearly. Thank you so much, Bianca. Kristen, hasn't this been such an incredible summit so far? It really has been, Lori. So why the need for the Latino Community Foundation and the Latinas Lead Giving Circle? Well, the Latino community is and has always been a very generous community, mm -hmm. a community of givers and philanthropists. We give our time, talent, and treasure daily. We give to our neighbors, friends, or families here in the state and back home. That's absolutely right. And the Latina Lead Giving Circle is powered by you through your small personal donations. And every contribution counts. Mm -hmm. The Giving Circle is just one way to be part of something bigger than ourselves. It's an easy way to actively engage in helping to build a stronger Latina community. And look, we know that this has and continues to be a challenging year for you and for Latino families everywhere. But it's exactly at these times that we all always come together collectively. And that's what we need to do here because together we're stronger. So today we're asking you and our community of Latinas and allies to join us by giving whatever meaningful amount you can. Every single dollar counts and every single dollar donated will go directly back into the community to small nonprofits that are work that are committed and working hard to support and strengthen our community's need and prioritizing leadership development for Latinas through their projects and their programs. All of that sounds amazing, Lori. And I think we can all agree, right, that after the year we had, we all deserve a little treat, right? Listen, I sure do. Lori, I know you do too. We mm -hmm. all deserve a treat. So today I ask you to treat your heart and treat your community instead of that expensive cafecito or those new hoop earrings, although I could, I do deserve an another pair. Or that, red, <laughs> or that red lipstick. How many shades do you have already, right? You can consider donating to the Latina's Lead Giving Circle and skip those new shoes you were going to buy. Just this once. We yeah, want to invite like each of you to be part of this journey <laughs> to empower and support Latinas across Colorado. And remember, the first 100 of you who donate will receive that beautiful one-of-a-kind Somos Divinas sticker, along with the gratitude of hundreds of Latinas across the state mm -hmm. who will benefit from your generosity and be able to receive support that advances their leadership through your donation. Plus. Kristen and I are going to be really, really grateful to you. I want that sticker. <laughs> <laughs> Go now to latinocfc.org forward slash donate. And together we can make a difference. Together we can build Latina power. Woo, which is why we're here, right? Build that power. Oh my God, sorry ladies, I was looking a little busted in that video, but you know, you can't be great every day. What an inc incredible show this has been, right? And guess what ladies, it's not over yet. Next, I want to introduce you to another super creative and innovative segment to the Power Summit, TikTok style videos. Yep, you heard me, TikTok. You know, you know that social media app, right? Where you can post videos of dance, music, tutorials, just funny stuff, anything you really want. Well, for this segment, LCFC has partnered, partnered with Gen Z Latina Changemakers, who will demonstrate how their generation is putting a personal spin on impacting change in our community. Join me now in helping amplify Gen Z voices from our Latino-led nonprofits and Hispanic-serving educational institutions. that encourage harsh disciplines in schools, push black and brown students out of schools at a disproportionate rate compared to white students. This is true. During the 2018 and 2019 school year, black students were 3.2 times more likely to be suspended than the white peers. And during the same school year, Latinx students were 1.7 times more likely to be suspended than their white peers. True or false? Students attend school with insufficient mental health resources. 
This is also true. 1.6 million students attend a school with school police, but not a counselor. Black and brown students need a school system that adequately addresses their needs. This includes better counselors, quality and relative educational content, and educators that care. Hola raza, mi nombre es Vivian Laura Reyes. Primero que nada, una advertencia, este video está en Spanglish. I'm here to tell you that dreams do come true as long as you do the work. Quieres eres poder, mientras tú quieras, tú puedes y vas a saber sobrepasar lo que se te cruce en tu camino. To, Aunque haya veces en donde te sientas que tu sueño o sueño no te puede alcanzar, even if there are moments when you feel like your dreams are out of your reach, I'm telling you as a dreamer and a DACA recipient, by a single mother of two who saw her cry, alguien que fue creada por una madre soltera de dos, que no vio cansada y trabajando sin descanso, lunes a domingo, graduándome de la Universidad Metro State con mi bachillerato de trabajo social y ahora persiguiendo mi maestría. Quiero decir gracias, mami, lo hicimos, nos graduamos. Solo es el principio y voy a seguir a hacerte sentir orgullosa y que valga la pena tu sacrificio. Hola a todos, mi nombre es Adriana. True or false, undocumented Latino immigrants do not pay taxes. What do you think? False. Undocumented Latino immigrants pay more than $100 billion in federal, state, and local taxes each year. Undocumented immigrants also pay sales tax and provide affordable labor for many of our nation's small businesses and corporations. This means that the labor provided by undocumented immigrants allows for goods and services to be more affordable for us consumers. Hi everyone, I am Jennifer, Color Organizing Fellow. Color is a nonprofit organization that works to enable Latinx individuals and their families to live healthy lives. Did you know that in Colorado from 1900 to 1941, giving birth became more westernized and eventually stopped issuing midwifery licenses? More shockingly, from 1908 to 1921, many women were forced into sterilization. Not only was women's reproductive health in danger here in Colorado, but also around the world. In 1956, clinical trials for birth control began, and they used women living in Puerto Rico. Too many times, our bodies have suffered from medical practices that are not made for our bodies. In a study done in 2016, most of the white medical students and residents believed at least one of these myths to be true. Women of color were used as guinea pigs because they were thought as to be less human and couldn't feel pain like white people. This is important to me because it's my health and my body. I want to feel safe in my doctor's office. Hola amigos, soy Brenda y um, soy orgullosa de decir que soy DACA y aquí en DACA recipient and a dreamer here in the United States. Como yo, hay mucha gente, muchos muchachos, muchas personas que están en el mismo lugar que yo. Pero eso no quiere significar que somos diferentes. Pero eso no significa 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 que somos I have been able to see the growth Como within myself and my community. De DACA, he visto el I'm proud en to say I am a DACA. And I'm not different. The only thing that tells no us apart is the fact that I don't have a citizenship here in the States. And that's okay. I have worked very hard to get myself to college. He trabajado muy duro Sometimes working para three pasar jobs. Por la universidad. And that makes a veces me con unique. Trabajos, But just única. like me, there's many DACA and dreamers yo, out there. So, you know, as a DACA and dreamer, de DACA. things haven't also been easy Como at all. Um, las cosas when no I realized that fáciles. I was on DACA um, I remember being in high school and all my bueno, friends um, applying prepara. to colleges and, you know, being able to um, go home and tell mom and dad, hey, look, I applied to this or that, um, to different colleges that I wasn't able to do. Um, it wasn't until 2012 when um, President Barack Obama decided to entitle DACA. And that gives me a work permit, an opportunity to be like a United States citizen. But I would say it has taught me 
to be proud. It really has. And I'm able to say that I was able to graduate from college this semester. Um, and the fight doesn't stop here. I think there's more to talk about. There's more kids, uh, women, men, um, like myself that are out there and that are also struggling. Um, and I think it's very important to people realize that, you know, we are dreamers. We're here to make America better. We're here to um, create the American dream. And um, I'm very proud to say that. I'm very proud to be part of this community because we work hard. And I know with a little bit of guidance and a little bit of um, belief from people, we're able to create a better place for all of us. And hopefully one day, you know, the Dream Act, um, would be reintroduced to the Congress or um, to the House and be able to pass and give us the opportunity to become American citizens because we are American citizens. I am an American citizen. I love America. I love my culture. I love being Mexican. I love it all. We need to uh, make sure we get everybody together and realize that the Dreamers and the DACA recipients also need that chance um, here in the United States. Daydream, why do you hurt me so? Love is presence. So thank you for allowing me to be in your presence and hopefully be in love, find romance in the various aspects that life gives us the various aspects of, of opportunity that we have. My mission is to elevate the accurate and relevant portrayal of Latinos in the media and to amplify, clarify, and magnify the voices of the marginalized in any way that I can. I recently got to perform for Biden's inauguration. I got to sing back up for Demi Lovato for the Biden-Harris inauguration, which was one of the great honors of my life. When I wake up in the morning, love, and the sunlight hurts my eyes, and something without warning, love, there is heavy on my mind, then I look at you. And the world's all right with me Just wanna look at you And I know it's gonna be A lovely day Coming out of that experience, I was blessed to do some really cool media spots and have some great conversations with a lot of really amazing journalists. And one of my favorite questions that I got to answer was, you know, what was the significance of, you know, of that experience in terms of sh kind of sharing that with the world? And it was just so exciting because I got to share with the world that this is what Latina looks like. This is what Oklahoma's 
Oklahoma looks like. This is what an Oklahoman looks like. Um, Latina, third generation American, English as my first language, Spanish as my learned language, um, those kinds of things. So just being able to share, you know, the accurate representation of who I am as an American, as a Latina, and as an Oklahoman is pretty exciting. I now have been a voiceover um, artist for over 20 years. Um, I have an audiobook on iTunes, Audible, um, all the places where you can engage uh, an audiobook. She was killed somewhere else, and the killer, or killers, waited until the deserted hours before dawn to arrange the corpse on the sand. But now we had a witness they hadn't counted on. I thought of that old nursery rhyme, who killed Cock Robin. Who saw him die? I, said the fly, with my little eye, I saw him die and do tons of commercial work and lots and lots of award shows. Award shows are probably my favorite. Um, and just, you know, get to do a lot of other things. All of that to say, it pays to volunteer. It pays to be a, a, a kind person, a punctual person, a professional person, um, because you never know where the relationships are going to land you. Um, and it pays to just say yes. So at the tender age of 39, I found myself, um, after going through my own personal health challenges with my diabetes, as well as extreme um, conditions regarding stress, I was a caretaker for my sister who was in a coma for quite some time. I found myself um, in the ICU after having a stroke. And it is the last thing that you expect when you're 39 years old to be in the hospital with a stroke. And um, the fear that took over my body um, in that moment, and it may sound vain and, and I'm okay with being transparent about that very real fear, but um, you know, I was so fearful that I wouldn't get to do this anymore. I wouldn't get to sing. I wouldn't get to speak and share and voice announce and, and do all the things um, because I didn't know how my voice would be affected. I didn't know how, obviously, you know, my mobility would be affected. Um, it was a very, very scary, unsure time. And luckily, with the amazing support system of my family, um, my incredible, incredible team and tribe who have loved on me and supported me, and said, you know what, Stephanie, I know you can't even fathom the idea of not doing things in the way that you did them before, but if you have to face that, we will face it. We will face it together. We'll figure it out.
And by all means, the challenges have still continued to ebb and flow because that's life and conditions and circumstances will do that. But I have never been happier than I am now once I made that commitment to my happiness. Um, knowing that you're gonna fall, knowing that you're gonna have you know, moments um, of you know, disappointment within yourself, or like I said, you, you know, your own natural response to, to life's circumstances, but being really committed to happiness has made all the difference in the world. just amazed by Stephanie. She is such a beautiful person inside and out and really did not see the part of her stroke coming into the story. Like did not anticipate yeah. that part of, of her story at all, Kristen. It's amazing to see she is like you this warm summer. Absolutely incredible. And I'll be honest, I knew about her stroke because I secretly stalk her because I've loved her. Even before my stroke, I was stalking her. And so she is incredible and just such a reminder of how powerful Athenas are. And we can really overcome anything. She's incredible. And made my heart so happy to hear Selena. No, me quedo oh, más. Of course. Oh, Hello. Go off, Stephanie. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we need right. in our lives. Yes. Our last order of business everyone is our final live poll for the day. So tell us if you're feeling energized and ready to take this power into your community. Mm -hmm. Lo hicimos, we did it. It has been so much fun co-hosting this Power Summit with you today, Kristen. Thanks so much for letting me come in on this side every now and then and say some things. This has been just like such a great time to get to hang out with you here and with all of these amazing Latinas who are sharing their stories and giving us such good advice. Well, Lori, what do we always say? Better together. This was such an amazing experience and it was only made better having you by my side per usual. I have been so empowered and uplifted and I really hope you guys have been too. I was able to see myself and every one of our speakers reminding us that Latinas are so strong and we have purpose and it's to embrace and empower and uplift our community. So I'm ready to go out there and make some change. That makes me happy and it's so incredible to hear, like you said, a little bit of ourselves in each one of these women's stories. And while we're all so different, there are also so many things that connect us. And that feels so good to know that you have a community that is really in the fabric of who we are, what we go through, what we experience. We're so not alone. And that's what makes something like this, this morning with all of you so special. Just reminds me how big our community is. Latinos are so strong. We are so powerful. We are so capable. Mm. But we are, like you said, Kristen, so much better together. And I'm so glad we have better this together. community of Latinas here. You and all of the women who are making this possible, all of the women who spoke today, and everybody else who joined us just to get to be a part. 1,000%. I mean, we're all family, right? That's how I feel every time I see a Latina. I'm like, oh, she's probably my cousin. 
We're all one big family here to support and love each other. And we just need to keep doing that in our community and make change. This has been so much fun, Lori. I'm so glad we're able to do this together. Oh, you also be too, Kristen. Thank you so much. And thank you again to the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado for making this yeah, possible yeah. for all the work that you do on this, all but right. also just the work that you do in Colorado all year round. You guys are incredible and we love this summit and we love this foundation. Thank you all for having us and thanks for joining us. Thanks guys. Bye. Adios. <laughs> Thank you for joining us at the 2021 Latinas Lead Virtual Power Summit. We hope our program has inspired you, sparked curiosity, and ignited your desire to apply some of today's learning and strategies to advance your personal and professional leadership. To share or replay this program, please visit us at latinocfc.org forward slash Power Summit Live beginning June 20th. You're only a few clicks away from resources, incredible content, and an online community available to you throughout the year. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter using the handle at LatinoCFC. Community driven and powered by your small personal donations, the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado will continue to strengthen the leadership development of Latinas so they can drive social change. Until we can gather in person next year, recuerdense que todas somos divinas.